They do have a clock in this podium. Welcome once again to the Feast of 2023. And welcome to the destiny and the future that we all are looking forward to. Because that's what these days very much picture as well. You can title the sermon, as I love to do so often, The Feast of Tabernacles, with a subtitle that is most important to answer the questions in all of our minds, and that is, why are you here? My first feast was in 1961 in Big Sandy, Texas. I have two brothers here. I have first cousins here. My wife, of course, is here my youngest daughter, my son-in-law, my grandchildren. And there's some of you that probably was at that first feast with me in 1961. And I heard that question ask, why are you here? And I was to hear that question many times at following feast as I would attend with my parents growing up. I've seen a lot of decades go by. This world has changed dramatically since my family and I kept that first feast. But why are you here? Have you really contemplated that? Have you really asked yourself that question? Today, I want to talk about that. And I want to highlight and give a lot of spiritual dimensions to that spiritual reminders of why are you here? We've come from every walk of life, every background, and we're here as a family, absolutely as a family, a family of believers. I would like to have a little bit of audience participation. I would like for those who are observing their first Feast of Tabernacles to raise your hands and keep them up and kind of wave them. If this is your first feast, hold your hand up and just wave your arms. We have a number of you in this feast. It's this feast of 2023. Thank you. And we welcome you now into the potential family of God. You are now among the very body of believers and you are here because God called you here to convene with all the rest of us. Now I might ask all of you who are celebrating at least 10 years of the feast, raise your hands. Those of you who have 10 years, wow. Keep them up, wave them a little bit. That's a lot of hands. Okay, thank you. Now I'm gonna go 25 years. How many of you are observing 25 years? Look at that. Okay. Now we get down to, you know where I'm going. How many of you have observed at least 50 years of feast keeping? Raise your hands. Look at this. Everyone look around. Look at those who have observed 50 years of feast keeping. Thank you. And then I come to that 60-year mark. Raise your hands if you have observed 60 years of the feast or more. Wave your arms. Hold your arms up and wait. I see several out in the crowd. And finally, you can let those hands down. And finally, has anyone observed the feast in this room? 70 years. Anyone? Wow. I'm going to call you out. Mary Ann Aust, 72. 72. And Jerry, well, I don't know Mary Ann. Wow. That's good. We are all here. It doesn't matter if you're keeping your first feast or if you've kept 10 or 25 or 50, 60 or 70. We're here for the same reasons and to be reminded of those reasons why we come here. And those reminders of why we keep the feast are all important as to how we are going to observe the feast for seven days. Because the eighth day that we call the last great day is a separate festival altogether. I will give you reminder number one. Reminder number one or lesson number one. Why are you here? I want you to turn in your Bibles to Leviticus 23. 
How many times do we go back to Leviticus 23? And yet God says always to remember. We are a people that God always asks to remember. Leviticus 23, the first reminder of why we are here. And it is the primary reason we are here. It is the primary and most profound reason that we are here. Leviticus 23, verse 1. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Jews. See, I'm keeping you awake. The feast of the Lord are the eternal which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feast. When we come to understand that these annual holy days and the weekly Sabbath are God's feast. And I love to say that the weekly Sabbath is that first high day supreme. I use the terminology, the Sabbath weekly is the grand marshal of all the holy days. It leads out the parade of holy days, as I love to say. But we're here today culminating the end of a season, and that is the season of God's festival plan all the way from Passover that will carry on right down through the eighth day. And here we are keeping the Feast of Tabernacles, a time that pictures most of all why you are here is to worship God. That is the primary reason we have been called here, is to convene before God, to conference with God, and to worship Him. Because when you come to understand our relationship between God and Jesus Christ, it is all about worship. And that's why we are here, to be reminded first and foremost that we came here a commanded assembly, his feast to worship him. And these annual days are those that we are to keep. I'd give you the second reminder, the second reminder why we are here, each one of us, and I love to pose it always as why are you here because you and I, each one of us, has to answer that in our hearts and minds. You notice I said hearts and minds. Because again, the way of God and worship to God has to be internalized. It cannot be something that is on the outside. Life has taught me. And being a child of the church and now an old man in the church, as I call myself, I have learned through life and life has taught me and God's way of life has taught me that above all, we are to have a relationship with God. And it always points us to worship and reverence to that God that we serve. We're here because we have been told to rejoice before God. That is your second reminder, second lesson. And we've heard that already. We heard it last night from our president, Rick Shaby. We heard it mentioned last night, this morning. We are, yes, here to rejoice. And I want to say something about rejoicing here in a moment, but I want you to turn to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 16. I hope there's no whispers out here when I said Deuteronomy 16. Here we go again. Deuteronomy 16, and I'll get there with you. Moses, inspired of God, here, drop down to verse 13. Deuteronomy 16, verse 13. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days, when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your manservant and your maidservant, and the Levite, the stranger, and the fatherless, and the widow who are within your gates. It is a family affair. And it was to be, in ancient Israel, a time when all within that whole household, servants, strangers, and all, were to celebrate and rejoice before God. Verse 15, seven days you shall keep a sacred feast of the Lord your God. Not just the high day, but seven days. 
And I don't know how in times past some have missed that. Seven days, God says, you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and all your work of your hand, so that you surely rejoice. We are commanded to rejoice. And then we see the familiar scripture, verse 16, about the offering that we often read. When you think about that word rejoicing, yes, we've come here to rejoice, and we rejoice now in the flesh. Our rejoicing now is as physical, finite human beings living out fleshly lives with a vision. And that's the vision we have. This, this whole seven days is to picture a vision, a view into a world that is yet coming. This world is not ours. This world is Satan the devil's at this time. And I think we all now more than ever can see that. But the world that we are looking forward to and that these days picture is coming. But we come here to rejoice before God, and we're told to do that. I don't know way back in my memory, way back in my memory, so many feasts ago, we had a message, and those of us, many of you in this room will remember this little cliche used by one of our ministers way back in the day. You can't be a grump at the Feast of Tabernacles. Some of you in this room, and as I saw many hands go up of 25 years and 50 years, some of you will remember that. And it, the minister made that comment in a sermon long, long ago. You can't be a grunt at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it caught on like wildfire. And that became kind of a catchphrase even the years following. If you heard someone grumble a little bit, you'd say, ah, remember, you cannot be a grump at the Feast of Tabernacles. We've come here to rejoice. And that's surely why we have. I love this season. Most of you know this is college football season, right? And I don't need to poll any of you as to your favorite team. You come from many different states, and you represent many different likes and dislikes. But this is the season when they they tailgate. You know how it is with before the college game, the big college game that day, they call it tailgating. All the people, the fans, they get together and they cook and barbecue and all that, and they make that pregame thing such a special time. I use the terminology, they have nothing on us. We spiritually tailgate for seven days here and then the eighth day. We have this wonderful time to come together in what is really an orientation time. This, this is like an orientation time, and I call it a spiritual tailgating time to where we come together and we fellowship and worship most of all before God. And it is a time of joy. And that rejoicing, though, when you think about why ultimately do we rejoice? Yes, we rejoice over a fine steak or a good plate of fried fish. That's the only way to cook fish, by the way, is fry them. But why do we rejoice? What is our rejoicing truly, truly about? Rejoicing for the future to come. Because God has called you and I. He's called you and I to be here. And where he places his name, wherever his are, that's where his presence is. His presence dwells in us. He tabernacles with us. And he tabernacles with us individually and collectively. And he places his name with those that are his. And no matter where we are, as the scripture says, where two or three are gathered together. And there are a lot more than two or three here today. And all of you listening by webcast today, hello to you. And I hope you're beginning a really good feast wherever you are today as well. Because we are brethren and family around this world. But we rejoice, do we not? As I often have loved to say in past messages at the feast, this is a foretaste. This is just a little taste. This is just a little taste treat. My wife and I actually went to Sam's here the other day. We got here a few days early, and we went over to Sam's in Panama City, and, and you know how it is, Sam's? They've got the little treat stations going again. And I've always loved to say if you go into Sam's and if you go by every little station where they offer you those little treats, you know, to sample, if you imbibe of enough of them, you can go out and you won't need supper that night. 
But we come here and we get this little bit of a taste. It's just a foretaste. It's a shadow. It's a shadow. As Colossians 2 tells us, it's a shadow of times to come. We have not yet experienced the real reality of his kingdom, but it's coming. It's coming. As a side frame at this point, I would say to all of us as God's people, more than ever, 2023 and beyond, more than ever, we need to pray thy kingdom come. More than ever, we need to be praying that above all things, above all things, thy kingdom come. As Mr. Shaby talked in the opening message last night, to bring peace, to send his son, Jesus Christ, to send peace to this earth. So we rejoice most of all in that calling that we have, that we are privileged. We are so privileged that God chose us to be here, to convene with us, to share with us, because that's literally what God is doing. I can see, and I hope in your mind's eye, you can see in your mind's vision, I hope you can see the throne of God right now. The host of heaven are rejoicing with us at this feast. Scripture tells us that when one sinner repents, that the whole host of heaven rejoice. Well, how pleased is the Father and Jesus Christ to see us, not only here in Panama City Beach, but all across this world where people are keeping the Feast of Tabernacles and will keep the eighth day, and the host of heaven are rejoicing with the Father and Jesus Christ. And so those are reasons we rejoice, not just over the physical things we will do here. That's just kind of a, a side point to it all. That's just kind of off to the side. Our greatest rejoicing has to be in the fact that he called you and he imparted to your mind by his Holy Spirit and by his presence gave you a part of who he is, his very nature, and then set before you that proper path that proper way of life that we each are hopefully trying to live. And that's another reason in my mind why we are here to rejoice. Spiritual reminder number three. You can, if you take notes, call it lesson. But spiritual reminder number three. We're here to be very much reminded that we are temporal creatures in this life. We are here today and so quickly can be gone tomorrow. There are those who were here last year that are not with us here this year. And that such is the way of human flesh. There is an attrition that takes place, as we all know, as we age. And as I look out at you, this audience here today in Panama City Beach, I see a lot of elderly people. I myself now am elderly, you know? And so there's this attrition, this, this life and death. And we don't many times like to think about our own mortality. But the older we get, those of us who are 70 now and pushing past, we understand that life is that way. And we have to start beginning to face the reality that this life is so temporal. I'm often reminded of James chapter 4, verse 4. James chapter 4, verse 4 that where he refers to life as a vapor here today and gone tomorrow. This is not our home. These are temporary homes that we live in. And when I say temporary homes, I'm talking about these physical tabernacles that we live in. Our physical abode, our physical bodies, they do not have a lifetime warranty as we all know. They have a very limited warranty. And so we're here reminded that we are just here on this earth as temporary sojourners, as pilgrims, and we're looking for something beyond. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. You may already still be there. Leviticus 23, look in verse 39. Verse 39, Leviticus 23. Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord. We see this again, the feast of the eternal. You shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there should be a Sabbath rest. And on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest. Verse 40, 
and you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice. We see that again. Rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And verse 41, you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations, and you shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And then we see starting in verse 42, another distinction that's given. You shall dwell in booths for seven days, and all who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That is temp temporary dwellings. That your generations, notice this, that your generations, plural, may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so Moses declared to the children of Israel, again, the feast of the Lord. We see here where ancient Israel was reminded by God through Moses that I brought you out of Egypt and as you sojourned into the wilderness and you learned to live in that temporary booth because you had not yet entered into the promised land. We are on that in that sense of saying we're on this side of Jordan. We have not yet crossed into that promised land, which is the kingdom of God. And we realize that a whole part and essence of this feast and a reminder also that goes with keeping this feast is that we are now temporary. We are living in temporary lives, booths, that is temporary lives as in the flesh. They last 70, 80, 90 years and that's it. And so this feast tells us that, that we are learning that lesson. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And if any of you speakers have some of these scriptures later in the feast as you give your messages, no problem. Because you will highlight some things as you give, you know, these same scriptures at times. But in Hebrews 11, as we look at something here, and how familiar we should be with verse 13 through 16, we find here in verse 13 of Hebrews 11, after it is spoken of many of these saints that have long been dead, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. Do we really, brethren, sense that? Do we really profoundly realize that? That our lives now are being lived in a temporary fashion because if time were to go on and that's another subject I won't get into but if the time were to go on and on most of us in this room would be gone and we would lie in our graves waiting for the resurrection and the seventh trumpet to sound just like many of the saints who are now in that sense behind us who are lying in the graves waiting waiting for the seventh trumpet to sound to join us one day, and I will say something about that in a little bit. Back to verse 14. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they have a better, that is a heavenly country, and therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And ultimately, brethren, Ultimately, New Jerusalem is our home, ultimately. And that's all found in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. The saints of God, the first fruits, the bride of Christ, ultimately will live and share in New Jerusalem with the Father in Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate home that we will one day have. But this present time, we're having to learn to live in these physical tabernacles and simply, can we say it very simply that a child could understand? We're trying to survive, are we not? We get struck with disease and viruses and sickness. And I pray to God that he will protect us in health as much as possible here in Panama City Beach to keep this feast, each one of us, and he will protect our health as much as possible. And all you listening as well, but we also, with our personal health, must do those things to help to ensure that we will have a good seven days, 
Uh, don't eat two steaks. Don't drink three glasses of wine, please. Enjoy the physical, but in all things, as Paul says, let's have self-control and have that proper temperance. Reminder number four. Spiritual reminder number four. To answer that question again, why are you here? Is to rejoice again, yes, in these seven days. And even though living in the physical, physical tabernacles, as I just covered in lesson three, but spiritual perspective and reminder four is all the while, where is our eyes? Where is our vision? It is looking forward. It is, as Paul said, pressing forward toward the kingdom. Our eyes, our vision must through every trial and test, no matter what we're going through, our eyes are never to be diverted from the goal, the kingdom of God. That is the goal. That is, the, that is what we're seeking. And when I say kingdom of God, that says eternal life. Because if you find yourself in the kingdom of God one day, you have arrived and you have arrived as immortal and you will be there. We must see it before we can achieve it. How many walks of life, all of you in this room, no matter what you may plan to do, you plan to achieve something, whatever it is that you may plan to achieve in this life, do you not first envision, contemplate it, think about it, and then you begin to visualize in your mind the objective and reaching that goal before you do it? And if you don't do that, most times you don't achieve the goal. But if you envision perspective, anticipation, if you're able to see in your mind and heart the dream and to see that dream and to make that dream come true, you will prevail and you will persevere until the end, as Christ said, and achieve that goal of eternal life in his kingdom. We are just so temporary, and yet we have a vision that is going to one day be born into the reality of having eternal life. If I got my date right, I think it was July 20th. I think it was July 20th, 1969. And when I said July 20th, 1969, many of you in this room may not remember right now. Well, what date was that now? It was the day that Neil Armstrong and those astronauts landed on the moon. And once again, when Neil Armstrong was the first human being to ever step onto the moon, and that first step that he took, he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for humanity. I've often thought about Neil Armstrong's statement as he stepped into another world onto another planet. Last I checked, the moon is a planet, right? Think about us. Think about it in the spiritual. We are taking small steps now. Even brethren, as we are real with one another and ourselves, even right now, we are taking small steps even so much of the time in our repentant daily lives. Repentance can be a tough thing, right? It's kind of hard to whip that old man into shape, right? We're taking small steps in that sense now, and we will take in that sense kind of small steps toward our Creator, always soliciting and asking His supreme help to help us to overcome but the day is coming when we are going to take a giant leap into eternity. And when that seventh trumpet sounds and all the saints that are behind us dead are waiting and we're all going to join together in the clouds to meet Christ and we're all going to receive that everlasting life and to be with our King, Jesus Christ forever, we are going to take one giant leap into infinity. Brethren, these days picture that because these days picture a time when the kingdom is going to be set up. And by that time, all the first fruits have reached their destination. And so we must have that view and vision here at this feast. 
that no matter what this physical life throws at us, we are going to be there and nothing will deter us. There are some scriptures in the Bible that I want to at this time read. If you'll turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. How many times I've gone to these verses because these verses picture a time coming of not only you and I, but all the saints from the ages. Revelation chapter 7, the Apostle John writing under inspiration of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ would tell John, just as Jeremiah would tell Baruch, when Jeremiah was going to speak, he'd tell Baruch, his trusted scribe, write it down, Baruch. Jesus Christ said to John, write it down. This is my revelation, John, write it down. And we see this time coming, starting in verse 9 of Revelation 7. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands. And the palm branches stands for victory. In verse 10, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What do you see here, brethren? You see worship. You see a worship scene. Verse, 13, verse 11, and all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. There you have it. The most supreme reason we're here is to worship God. And the supreme reason throughout the universe ahead, and it will always be that all the universe forevermore will always give praise and glory to God and the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ that sits on that throne beside him. Verse 12, and they're saying, or singing, amen, blessed and glory uh, and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And then verse 13, one of those elders, that's one of those 24 elders that's mentioned. One of those elders answered who are around the throne of God saying to the me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where do they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know. And so he said to me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. And therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Brethren, that will be the saints from all ages who have persevered and endured to the end, who have kept the faith. And they will be there together as one eternal family and they will forevermore be with Jesus Christ because they will be his bride. Something was mentioned about the wedding supper earlier. That wedding supper will happen. We can't even imagine how it's going to be. But we read here about the rejoicing. And for the first fruits, all who are the first fruits from every age of time will share in this time together. No more tears, no more sorrow. And then we will be turning around as I will soon talk about and begin to help others find that same way of life that we have lived. And that's the fifth spiritual reminder, the fifth spiritual reminder of why you are here to keep this piece of tabernacles is simply and yet profoundly, we are now preparing we now are preparing for that world to come. We are preparing and God is now preparing us. He is preparing us as spiritual vessels. We are those spiritual vessels at this age. And God has prepared those spiritual vessels from every age of time, those again who are the first fruits. And we all together have been and are being prepared 
to help Jesus Christ begin to build that next world when he comes that this feast pictures a thousand years, a thousand years of a sabbatical rest, the weekly Sabbath, or I should say the millennium, the seventh day pictured of a thousand years is a type of the weekly Sabbath. We rest each weekly seventh day called the Sabbath. We rest on that day. And this is a type rest during the millennium where for a thousand years, Jesus Christ will begin to set up and reign and begin to establish peace and harmony and a rest for humanity. By the time we get to the millennium and all the holocaust that is going to have happened from the three and a half year period of time, the world is going to desperately need the rest that Jesus Christ provides. And so we're here picturing that time, that kingdom to come, that world to come, when we with Christ will help build it. And just reminders, go to Revelation 5. You're probably still there, hopefully, in Revelation, Revelation 5. Beautiful words here that Christ inspired John to write. Revelation 5, verse 8. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll. Even here we see again what leaps, what leaps out at us to our consciousness. We see worship. We see worship to the Lamb of God and the Father who sits on the throne. You are worthy to to take the scroll and to open the seals for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And that's what we saw in chapter seven of Revelation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. That is our destiny. That's what lies ahead for each one of us. We have this beautiful destiny. That's why I said, as I introduced the message earlier, I said, welcome to your future destiny, because that is our destiny. We're going to be there with Jesus Christ, and we're going to reign and rule with Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. A remarkable prophecy for us, the saints of God the family of God, the first fruits. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus, those who had been persecuted to the point of death. And for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Brethren, when I read, there will be thrones and the saints will sit on them. We shall have judgment given in our hands along with Jesus Christ. And we shall be there with Christ. We shall be his administration. We the saints, his bride as it is, by his side. And that is something I want us to leave this feast, never forget. The bride of Christ will remain by the side of Christ for all eternity. And I'm looking at the bride of Christ to be right now. And all of you who are listening by webcast today, I love Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. You can jot it down, I'll quote it. Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. It shall be given to the people, the saints of God. I love to say, it is a wedding gift from the groom to his bride. The kingdom is his gift to us. And we again shall be with Christ forever. I said in my message on the day of trumpets, the feast of trumpets here shortly back, I made the statement 
we don't have to be so overly concerned in one way about what's going to happen after the seventh trumpet sounds besides being changed. No matter what happens after the seventh trumpet sounds, it won't matter from the standpoint we're going to be with Christ wherever he is. Whatever he's doing, we're going to be with him. And that's kind of all we need to know right now. We shall be with Christ wherever he is. Wherever he goes, we shall be with him. So we look at this time that we keep, the Feast of Tabernacles, and we realize that we are right now in the process of being sealed, of being preserved. We are each one now in this flesh being sealed with a promise, a promise that we shall one day receive eternal life in his kingdom. And not only just eternal life, but brethren, as I hope I've showed just a few scriptures, but we have a vision that we shall rule and reign with Jesus Christ. And that is also why we're here. The time I have left, as I look at this clock on the podium up here, I want to just bring it now back to kind of totally back to us. And I want to talk about us for a little bit before I close today. Those of us here, those of listening in, the saints everywhere. We are living in a world presently that has changed dramatically. If I look at the world that was when I was eight years of age, when I kept that first feast in 1961 in Big Sandy with my parents and my brothers and other family members that were there with us, as I look now at that world that was then and I look at this world now, there is no comparison I don't recognize this world from the world I once knew even, even this physical world. And brethren, it was referenced by Mr. Shaby last night, if you call it. This world is going to get a lot worse probably quicker than we would hope it would. It's going to get bad. It's already bad. We cannot sugarcoat it, right? I want you to turn to Joshua. Joshua. Because I want us to never forget the words that God said to Joshua. The book of Joshua, chapter 1. As you're turning to Joshua 1, Moses had died. Joshua was now to lead Israel into their promised land. They had wandered for 40 years in their rebellion, their obstinance to God, and now they're about to enter the promised land under Joshua. And God had given these words to Joshua to speak to Israel. And I want to pick it up in verse 2. Two, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I, was, which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I have said to Moses. And from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, and all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. I'm going to give you all this good land. I'm going to give you this land of milk and honey, as he had told them, he had promised. And God never goes back on a promise. God cannot lie. You know, we find that in Romans 3. Verse 5, no man, that is no man, no one, he says, God does to Joshua to tell the people, shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. How much more to the church? Hebrews 13, 6, from memory, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6 or verse 8, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we see that same promise here to ancient Israel. The same promise is to us, the church. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as I read these words that God gave to Joshua to speak to ancient Israel, these words are even more magnified to us, the church, today because we are under a new administration called the New Covenant. And his laws and commandments are magnified. They are to be magnified within our inner man. They're to be written on the tablets of our heart, not just on some physical tablets of stone. They should be internalized. And these words speak to us, the church today, more than ever. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. 
Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. If God would through Joshua give this to tell ancient Israel, how much more to we, that spiritual nation of a kingdom of priests that we read about in 1 Peter 2, 9. Because how many times have we quoted 1 Peter 2, 9, you're a holy kingdom of priests to me. You're a holy kingdom to be kings and priests. We have been in, we have had God's very nature, his very spirit given to us as a down payment through repentance and baptism and the laying on of hands. For those of us, these words mean so much more, do they not? No matter what happens around us in this world this year, no matter what happens, we cannot turn to the right nor the left. We must keep our focus on what's coming, and that is the kingdom of God. And these Feast of Tabernacles, the days that we keep, are reminders of that future, that life that is coming, that world that is coming, when we're once again going to take a giant leap into a whole new world. Verse 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. And it doesn't say that we get to cherry pick what we want to do and what we don't want to do. That's what's wrong with mainstream religion. They cherry pick the things they want to do and the things they don't want to do, they cast aside. You know it and I know it. I call it religion of convenience. Most religion worships with a religion of what I call convenient worship. If it's convenient, we do it. If not, we don't. That's just straight talk. We go on here reading, Verse 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And brethren, I see this very much more than ever as a message to the church today, the saints of God. No matter what happens, be strong, be courageous, fear not. Fear, fear can rob us of our faith. We went through a crisis, did we not, with that sinister virus called COVID. We were tested. And I stand up here today and I say unabashedly and boldly, the church was also very much tested with how we handle COVID or didn't handle it properly. It was a test most of all for us. And any test that's coming upon society is going to be more a test for us, the church. And there's something else coming. I don't know what it is, and you don't either. What's going to test us this year? What's the world going to look like six months from now? What's it going to look like three months from now? What's it going to look like next year when we want to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? The world is changing very fast. And so these words come to my mind often. Be strong. Be courageous. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We must remember that as we go back to our homes this year because I think it's that important. And last in this chapter, or this book of Joshua, in chapter 24, in chapter 24 of Joshua, how many of you have this plaque maybe on your wall in your home? And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself, Joshua says, this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river are the gods of the Amorites in which whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is what it's going to come down to. It's going to come down to we're either going to serve the gods of this world, little g, or we're going to serve the God of heaven. That's what Elijah told those on Mount Carmel that day, those false prophets, and he told the people, he said, either God is God, or the God of Baal is, paraphrasing. That's exactly what he's telling. Either you will serve the true God, or you will serve those false gods. You, we cannot serve God in mammon. 
So when I read Joshua's words that God gave to him to speak to ancient Israel, those words should be marching orders to us, the church today. Be strong. Be courageous in the Lord. It's not your faith. It is his faith that he deposits in us through and by the power of his Holy Spirit. I don't have the faith to overcome a lot of physical human fear, and most of us or any of us don't. It is only God's power, his strength, his faith in us, through and by his presence in us, through and by the Spirit, that we can have the kind of faith to overcome fear. And I wanted to read those things today because in my mind, we're very much a people that, like ancient Israel, are being told to fear not. I'm going to finish the message today in this manner. We've been called here to rejoice, first of all, to worship God, to, to rejoice before him, to be reminded that we're temporary dwellers in this physical life, to be reminded that the vision is that we're going to have new life with new bodies that will live and survive for eternity with Jesus Christ, and that we're here also to be reminded that we are preparing for them, for those who will walk into the millennium and all that remnants, not only from Israel, not only the remnant from Israel, but the remnants from the other nations that will survive what I call the three and a half years of Holocaust because humanity is going to be devastated and yet there will be the physical seedlings, so to speak, that God will use through Jesus Christ to start a kingdom called the kingdom of God and his son. And let us never forget that. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of the father who his son under him will administer. And then one day, the father himself and New Jerusalem ultimately will dwell with his family in that beautiful city and time. It's a beautiful plan and story, is it not, brethren? These are the things we not only need to in, you know, understand and realize here presently keeping this faith, but lessons that we take home and to understand why you came here. What is the supreme reasons that you came here? I want to close with a personal story today. 1997, my mother had died on Memorial Day of Cancer, 1997. My wife and our daughters took my father to the feast at Branson, Missouri in 1997. Mom had died on Memorial Day, and then we took Dad to his last feast, as it would turn out to be, in Branson in 97. It was on the eighth day, dad was in very bad health, and I'd gotten a wheelchair, and my dad could walk with the aid of a cane, but he would exhaust himself pretty quickly if he walked too much using his cane. So I just got a wheelchair, and I would wheel dad everywhere. You know, every day I'd wheel dad in the service out and everywhere, you know, so he didn't have to walk. My father was sitting in that wheelchair on the eighth day, that we call the last great day. And we were getting ready for the afternoon service. And he was sitting there in the chair and he looked up at me. And dad had blue eyes. And he looked at me from the wheelchair, looked up from those blue eyes and very seriously said, son, I will be keeping the feast in Jerusalem next year. He knew, he knew. He was on a high. We got him home. He died in December. I look back on that and those words many times, and I've thought about what my dad said to me. All of us in this room and listening in, how many of our loved ones lie in the grave right now waiting to join us at the seventh trumpet? This feast this annual reminder of that world that is coming represents for us the first fruits, most of all, the time when we shall be raised to eternal life. And can you imagine what it's going to be like 
with Jesus Christ, when all of us as the saints of God together keep that first Feast of Tabernacles in the millennium. Because Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16, Zechariah 14, 16 speaks of the nations being invited and told to come keep the feast at Jerusalem. We shall all be keeping that feast in that millennium to come, that time frame we call the kingdom of God. And when we keep it then, and most of all our vision now, our vision right now should be most of all focused, and our rejoicing should be most of all focused looking forward to when we, with Jesus Christ, our Lord, King, and Savior, will be with us, and we will keep that feast, not only during that millennium, but when the billions will come up in the great white throne judgment, it will go on, and we always will be with Jesus Christ, that is, we the bride, because we will be with Christ by his side, throughout eternity. Have a wonderful feast. Rejoice most of all in that great calling that you've been given.